Now we're ready to try and differentiate between the exponential survival model, the Weibull survival model, and Cox proportional hazard model. Previously, we laid a bit of foundation, and we said that we want to estimate a survival function, okay, a nice smooth curve for the survival function. And we learned how we can use this, and we can estimate the survival function using e to the negative hazard times t. Right, so this is going to create this negative exponential shape. The hazard is the rate at which the curve is decreasing. And we built up the idea that we can estimate the hazard, right, the rate of decrease, using a regression model. Here we're using an exponential, exponential function of x variables. Or we can think of it as we're modeling the log hazard as a linear function of x variables. So we can use this regression model, estimate the hazard, and then sub that in here to get the survival function. And we talked about the idea that um, what really differentiates exponential Weibull and Cox proportional hazard model is this intercept term and how that works. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into that. Before we do, I just want to mention, we can think of, if you remember B naught, right, the intercept term, it's kind of generic interpretation was the y value, right, or the left-hand side of the equation's value, when all x's are zero. So in this way, we can think of B naught as telling us the log hazard for the reference group. Right, so for, for either all numeric x is zero, or the reference categories, if they're categorical. And there I said, at time equals zero. Okay, I'll explain exactly what I mean by that. In the exponential model, this b naught, this intercept term, it's a constant. Okay, so it's just a number. So in that sense, you can kind of take the quotes and the red line off of it. It looks just like all the other regression models we've seen before, right? B naught is just some constant or some numeric value. Okay? It doesn't change. So you can see here, right, there's no t, there's no time in this function. So the hazard is just going to be a function of the values of x, but not time at all, right? Meaning the hazard is constant. We sub in the values of x, we're going to get the estimated hazard for any time point, right? And if you remember, that's what we were saying about the exponential, right? It has a constant hazard. Now, the Weibull, where this differs a little bit, this B naught, the intercept term, it increases proportionally with time or it can decrease proportionally with time. But it, um, one or the other, okay? So as time goes by, we can think of the B naught, the intercept is slowly increasing, or we can think of it as slowly decreasing. So here, it increases with time. That's saying the hazard increases with time. As time goes by, if the hazard is slowly increasing, sorry, if B naught is slowly increasing, we can think of that as capturing a hazard that's slowly increasing over time. Maybe I'll fill in the value for that. The value is not so important for you to, uh, to, to worry about when we're fitting these models in software, but just for the sake of kind of completing the discussion, if we take the log of alpha times the log of t plus b naught. All of this is what goes into this kind of b naught in the quotations term. Okay, so you can see b naught, that tells us what is the log hazard right, for the reference group at time zero. Then, as time increases, this is the portion that's getting and have added to the intercept term, right? We can see um, log of time. As time gets bigger, it's going to add something bigger. And we can add here, if alpha equals 1, what's going to happen? The log of alpha, right, the log of 1 is 0. 
this is all going to disappear. Okay, so alpha equals 1 means we're working with a constant hazard. Okay, this collapses to being the exponential model. Right again, if you put alpha of 1, log of 1 is 0, all this is going to disappear. If alpha is greater than 1, what's going to happen? This is going to become um, a number larger than 0, and the hazard is going to increase with time. So alpha greater than 1 means there's an increasing hazard. If you put an alpha term less than 1, log of something less than 1 is going to become a negative number. This is going to give us decreasing hazard. As time goes up, so again, if alpha is less than 1, as time goes up, this negative number gets bigger and bigger, and the hazard decreases. This is the way kind of the Weibull model works. Um, it allows the kind of the hazard to be a function of time, right? Or I should say more accurately, allows the hazard to be proportional with time. As time increases, the hazard can increase. And just throw in a keyword. Sometimes these get called uh, accelerated failure time models. Now, Cox proportional hazard model, this B naught, it's a function of time. So it can fluctuate, meaning increase and decrease with time. It's a function of time. Okay. So we can see here in this model, the kind of hazard increases proportion with time. Every time t goes up 1, the hazard goes up by this amount. Here in the proportional hazard model, the hazard can fluctuate. It can increase, it can increase rapidly, then flatten out, then decrease, then increase again. So it can bump around. It's some function of time. Now, often the way this gets written is that we have the log h naught of t. Okay, so this is the function that's defining the hazard. And this here. is what B naught is. Now, um, one of the kind of great innovations that um, Cox had with the Cox proportional hazard model is he came up with a way that you can estimate B1, B2, up to BK. Okay. So you can estimate all the coefficients in the model without having to specify this function. So essentially, it's a model that allows the hazard to increase or decrease with time to be a function of time that fluctuates. And you found a way that you do not have to specify how it fluctuates over time, and you're still able to estimate the coefficients from the model. Just to mention, earlier we are talking about pros and cons of each of these models. So we said, if you remember with the proportional hazards model, we cannot estimate the survival function itself. And the reason is, if we do not specify what the uh, what is called the baseline hazard function, okay, if we do not specify this, then we actually do not get any estimate of the intercept. We're saying the intercept can fluctuate up and down over time, and we're not going to specify how it fluctuates up and down over time. But by not estimating that, you cannot actually estimate the hazard to then estimate the survival function. Um, but yeah, so where this comes in handy is it does allow us to estimate the other coefficients. And if our goal is to estimate just hazard ratios, right, so if our goal is to say, how does survival affected by treatment A versus treatment B, or exposure versus non-exposure? If we want to say, what effect does some variable x1 have on survival, we can get a hazard ratio. Cost-proportional hazard model works well. If our goal is more predictive, if we want to say what's the probability of surviving beyond a certain time point, cost proportional hazard model will not allow us to answer those sorts of questions. Okay, so again, um, just since we've kind of hit that point, cost proportional hazard model is quite good for effect size models where we want to estimate hazard ratios. It doesn't really work for predictive models where we want to predict survival. Something like these, the exponential or the Weibull model, they work for both. We can uh, be predictive and 
estimate survival, or we can estimate hazard ratios from these. Although, as mentioned, we said sometimes they're a bit less realistic than this one here. And then just to complete that discussion, earlier we talked about the Kaplan-Meier model. This one can work for predictive, right? It can allow us to estimate what's the probability of surviving beyond a certain time point. It cannot estimate hazard ratios. So it doesn't really work for an effect size model. So what we're going to do is continue on, continue on these discussion and start to fill in some more details of each of these with more focus on Cox proportional hazards model. We'll also have some separate videos where we look at implementing each of these in R, um, again with a focus on Cox proportional hazards. Stick around guys, there's more to see and please stay safe.